On the breakfast, Senate approves the amendment of the Administration of Criminal Justice Act. Also on the breakfast, Germany knocked out of the World Cup after German beat Spain in a stunning upset. We'll have a further conversation with a sports analyst as regards Japan and Spain. Don't forget, we'll also be looking through today's newspapers, analyzing the biggest stories of the day. It's the Breakfast on Plus TV Africa. Welcome. I am Messi Bopo. I mean, it would be great to say compliment of the season, or maybe Merry Christmas already. Well, uh, the countdown has already started and we're looking forward to 2023. But today's the 2nd of December. As always, we start the conversation with what's making the rounds, what's it, having people, uh, what conversations are people talking about, what are people engaging with offline, online, and what have you. Now, one of it is that, uh, you know, the court has ordered an arrest and imprisonment of a chief of army staff. That's a lot. Quite dicey. But let's delve into it. A high court sitting in Mina, Niger State, has issued a warrant of arrest for Farouk Yahaya, a chief of army staff, for contempt. Now, a warrant of arrest was also issued against Ulubenga Lubanji, a commandant of training and doctrine command in Mina over the same offense. The issue is contempt. Now, this would not be the first time we're talking about contempt. Let's not forget this contempt, the issue. There's also been an arrest uh, talking about the IGP, Usman. Uh, there's been uh, issue of contempt as regards it as well. Uh, we also want to talk about uh, the EFCC boss. Another issue of contempt. So it seemed like we probably might just be in that era. And this has gotten a lot of Nigeria talking. Now, following the ruling on the application, Halima Abdul Malik, the presiding judge, said that an order is made committing the Nigerian Army Force of uh, Army Chief, I beg your pardon, of staff, General Farouk Yahaya, and the Commander Training and Doctrine Command in Mina, so sixth and seventh respondent, into the custody of Correctional Center for contempt of the order of this honorable court made on the 12th uh, of October 2022. I'm sure that you know, because we've talked about the issue of contempt over time, you probably would be asking, what is contempt of the court? So it's a case where a person who is a party to a proceeding in a superior court of record fails to comply with an order that's made against him. Now, the reason why this is dicey, I mean, when, when we started this conversation is because it's very dicey. We're talking about the chief of army staff. I need to emphasize, he's the chief of army staff. He's the chief of army staff. Can the chief of army staff or a military personnel, high ranking, be tried in a civil court? These are some of the conversations that's been going on online. Can he be arrested? And if he can be arrested, who should arrest him? Should it be the police or a military police? Now, where lies the military of, or where lies the rule of law? Because we talk about the, this is, this is a, I mean, a democratic dispensation. We can't take that out. Now, so far, it's important to note that the military is governed by both the civil and military law. However, the civil court does not have the powers to try an active military officer unless he has undergone a court martial by the military and dismissed, you know, respectively from the service. It, it, it brings us back to the reality of the issue of being in a democratic dispensation. We're in a democracy, and that's what it is. Now, if you have a military which is governed by the military uh, and the civil law, now, whose report, or where should they tilt to, which, you know, which would hold sway? It's because, of course, the military would have code of conduct that govern their affairs, their procedures and laws and what have you. There's also a martial court for the military. But where lies, you know, um, the Constitution? You want to begin to ask the Constitution and the military code of conduct, which is supreme. 
because this is a case, a case of disobedience. And the judiciary over time has been queried and there's been a lot of conversation about, oh, the judiciary is not functional, there's a lot that's going on, there's uh, executive rascality that has actually translated or is affecting the functionality of the judiciary. On the other hand, we begin to ask, how can the judiciary be effective in all of this? being, you know, another, you know, arm of government and what have you. So the conversation is going on. And now, so th this, is, this, this is something that has happened in almost a span of uh, less than three weeks or almost a month. There's been several order, and we're looking at high personnel. EFCC, you have police officer, and now you have chief of army staff. But is the Constitution supreme? or is the Code of Conduct Supreme? I mean, really, can he be arrested? That's the question. Can he be even be tried in a civil court? What, what exactly? And if he can't be tried, then what, where does uh, the issue or the conversation about the rule of law? Because when we talk about the rule of law, the principle of separation of powers, uh, we begin to say that no one is above the law. So uh, is the chief of army staff above the law? Uh, can he be arrested? It's, it's not a question that I have, you know, a lot of answers, but these are the conversations that are going on. At the end of the day, if we say that the military, the chief of army staff cannot be arrested because he has to be tried by a martial court, and therefore, uh, where will we, what we talk about the respect for the rule of law? Because of course now, if you say there's contempt, it's a disrespect to the judiciary. There's an order that should be respected. And so far, it seems that that has become, you know, a thing for us as a country. If you look at Nigeria now, and if you look at this administration, which is led by President Mohamed Buhari, there's a lot of court, you know, um, disobedience, if you want to say. Court orders are not respected. W what exactly is going on? And this case is highly sensitive, especially when you say he's a chief of military service, and you look at the laws that are governing. But, he's, you know, the military, like I rightly mentioned, uh, it's also still governed by civil rules, and so, um, you know, no answer to that particular one. But we hope that, you know, our constitution would constantly go through all of the reviews that it should, you know, go through. Now, another on the top trending is another interesting conversation. Very, very nice. It talks about our language, and over time, people have said, what should be the lingual franca for Nigeria? Some people think that. Uh, Nigeria should adopt pidgin language. My, you know, some people would say broken English, you know, broken English or you know, pidgin, what have you. The Federal Executive Council, which usually converge every Wednesday, approved the adoption of mother tongue as uh, a compulsory medium of instruction in primary schools in the country. So the government in all of this said, yes, they've agreed to the fact that the implementation would be a difficult issue. Uh, of course, uh, Adamu, who's a uh, minister of education, said that mother tongue will be used exclusively for the first six years of education, while it will be combined with English language at uh, junior secondary school level. So, expressly, the government has said that mother tongue is to be used in each schools, and it will be, you know, by the dominant language spoken by a community, what institution uh, you have. Uh, so, for instance, I, I like to cite an example. They're saying, for every time you have a language used in that institution, it will be a language that's dominant in that community. So, if you have a school in a certain community, the language that is dominated by that community would be the language that would be, you know, used uh, for learning and teaching and whatever you you want to go on with all of that. So, but in all of this, if you look at the rationale, if you look at the rationale behind all of this. Uh, it's very interesting. But let's also look at the interest, the purpose for this. The government is saying that this, in theory, is a policy that has already taken you know, effect, waiting for implementation when the government itself would actually develop instructional materials and qualified teachers, engage qualified teachers uh, you know, to get ahead with it. So that's exactly what we're looking at. But you also need to know that 625 languages is what we're talking about in Nigeria, as at the last count. And the objective, like I said, is very brilliant because it's meant to promote and enhance cultivation and the use of Nigerian languages, uh, protect our culture, values, and the list is almost endless. It is really brilliant. But 
don't we think that this also might further divide us as a people, as a country? It's also good that the government has admitted to the fact that, hey, it would be difficult to implement. So for instance, I'm looking at a state. I really don't know if there's any state in Nigeria that has diverse languages. One is Kursiva State. So let's say uh, there's a school that's instituted in Kursiva State. Kursiva State has 18 local governments. And in all of these 18 local governments, they have various languages. Some people have said, you know, jokingly that maybe the Tower of Babel, looking at the story of the Bible, uh, you know, that's where it started, starting Cross of the State, because you could probably have a, you know, a community, and in the community, the road uh, would be a divider. So uh, this community, community A and community B, might be speaking different languages or different language. So what happens? How do we, um, you know, foster unity with all of this? Will this not further promote um, this unity? and marginalize the minority that have already been marginalized. So it's a lot. I think it would have been a policy that should have been thought through by the government. If we're talking about major issues that we're faced with as a country, which is not rocket science, you don't need any medical, I mean, a, a native doctor to tell you about it as an issue of unity as a country. So if unity seems to be a major issue, how do we unite the country? Is this policy going to solve the problem? Is it further going to divide us as a country? Would he, you know, continue with the issue of agitation? Because when you now begin to see a dominant language for a certain community, your host community, that would be the language. Let's not forget that you have in a particular community, one community that might have different languages def depending on, you know, the practices. So it's going to be a lot, really difficult. And um, one would rather think that the government should say, okay, it's, it's that we would introduce all of these languages, uh, these courses, so you can take a certain course. There will be a course in Yoruba, there will be a course in Igbo, there will be a course in Hausa, there will be a course in Ejagam. There are different languages. You just begin to say, yes, people can offer all of these courses, wherever it is that they are, rather than say that we're going to be lecturing them, they will be tutored in this language. And do we still have a crop of persons who can speak this language? Because we're talking about transfer of culture, knowledge, and what have you. There's a lot to grapple with, but however, fingers are crossed. Let's see how this pans out. Away uh, from that, let's uh, look at another one. Very interesting is that the court has remanded, or the court remands students for a tweet against the wife of the president, Aisha Buhari. Now, uh, Justice Yusuf of the Federal High Court, uh, Federal Capital Territory High Court, has reminded one Amino Adamu, a student of the uh, Federal University of Dutse, Jigawa, at the Suleja Correctional Center in Niger State, after tweeting about the wife of uh, the president, Mrs. Aisha Buhari. The student was arraigned for cyber stalking, where he was denied bail despite pleading not guilty to the charges filed against him. You also need to know that this student in question, Mohamed Adamo, is a, a 500 level student who was arrested by security officials on the order of the, the president's wife a few days you know, before all of this actually happened. And that also is an issue because we say if someone has broken the law, of course, the, 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 uh, the law talks about libel and uh, defamation, you know, all of that, it's within the constitution. But has the president's wife or the presidency acted contrary to um, the law before, you know, having another court order and what have you? So it's, it's really very sensitive. But like everyone would, or would say, we're a nascent democracy, we're developing, and we hope that we get it right. Now, uh, like I mentioned earlier on, he was arrested. Mohammed was arrested uh, just because of that tweet that he, he, he had put out in June in Hausa. And the interpretation says that the president's wife was feeding fat on poor people's money. And that comment was underneath a picture of the president's wife where he's added weight. And you know, the thing with weight is, it's really very, <laughs> it's, it's very um, sensitive, especially with women. You probably don't want to tell a woman that she has added weight because it doesn't even really add up if you want her to devour you and <laughs> what have you. But um, biologically, some people will tell you that weight comes with you know, the age and not necessarily what you consume. You get to a certain stage and maybe your um, DNA, your composition and what have you, it's possible that you get to that point. But how this was handled, does it really reflect a democratic governance or democratic process? 
Is it in accordance with the law, you know, from start to open to the point that we are, have we acted, you know, as the uh, wife of the president or the presidency on those who are acting, lawmakers, I mean, I beg your pardon, those who are supposed to enforce the law, uh, security officials, have they acted in accordance with the law or they have acted contrary? All of these are uh, the issues that are on the forefront and Nigerians have been talking about. However, he will be remanded in the Suleja prison pending the hearing and determination of his bill application. Very, very unfortunate. But does not take out the fact that we need to understand what the Lord talks about. We need to be very careful and cautious. Not necessarily because we're afraid of being in jail or being in prison for whatever it is, but that we should be careful in our thoughts, in our reactions, and how we get to express ourselves on social media as regards, you know, people whether or not they are highly classified, they are the elite or not the elite, uh, we should be very kind with our words. We can still go ahead and make, you know, statements and make valid, you know, proposition without having to be uh, very, very, um, you know, defamatory in all of that, okay? Uh, we take a break and when we return, it'll be time for us to go through the pages this morning. We call it Off the Press. G.D. Johnson will be joining us. Please stay with us.